All right, so good morning, everyone, and welcome to another exciting broadcast with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know that it's our first few weeks of operation, so a lot of you are still new to us, joining us for the very first time. And if that is the case, then we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. It has been a thrilling start to September. We have done 28 broadcasts since September 11th or something crazy like that. We've had marine plastics researchers, volcanologists. We were hanging out with a Star Forge stellar formation expert yesterday, an astrophysicist from California. It has been an incredible journey, and as many of you know, everything that we do goes to our YouTube channel, stays there forever. So if you want to watch this program in three weeks or three years down the road, you can absolutely do so, share with family and friends and more. Now, I'm, I'm a pretty enthusiastic guy, as you can tell, and many of our teachers have worked with me for years. So I love all the work that we get to do, but I am, even by that standard, particularly excited for today's broadcast because I now live in Cornerbrook, Newfoundland, one of the best places in the world. I'm so thrilled to be here over the last year. And just a few hours up the coast from me is one of the coolest Parks Canada sites, UNESCO World Heritage sites, and more on planet Earth, and that is Launce of Meadows. For many of you, this will be your first time hearing about it. I don't want to steal their thunder. I'm going to let Dale uh, at Launce of Meadows explain a little bit about the amazing site that they have up there. Hopefully encourage you guys to come visit one day, but without further ado, with 550 kids joining from around the world. Welcome in Dale at Launce of Meadows and please explain a little bit about what the site is and why it is so special. Take us away. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. Thank you. Uh, hello everyone and welcome to Launce of Meadows. I'm so excited to have everybody here with us and to have a chance to share with you and your classmates some of the exciting things about Launce of Meadows National Historic Site and the Vikings that came here a thousand years ago. Uh, we are located, if you're looking at a map, we're located right at the tip of the Great Northern Peninsula, right in the northern end of the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Over a thousand years ago, Norsemen from Greenland sailed west and they found a new land where they built houses and for approximately 10 years over, over 30 years, they spent 10 years here exploring the land and loading their ships with cargo goods to take back home to Greenland. For many years, people have searched for Vinland. The stories of voyages of Norsemen, and by the way, we call them Norsemen. A lot of people call them Vikings, and maybe at some point during the broadcast, we'll have an opportunity to, to just uh, clue you in on the difference between a Viking and a Norseman. Um, there were stories that got written down about their voyages to Vinland. The stories are called sagas. And there were two sagas. One was the saga of the Greenlanders, and the other was Eric the Red Saga. And together they're known as the Vinland Sagas. In 1960, which is not that long ago, after many years of searching, Elg Ingstad from Oslo, Norway, who was searching for these ruins that he knew existed somewhere simply because of the stories that were told about the voyages. He arrived at Lanza Meadows and he spoke with a local gentleman called George Decker. And he asked if there were ruins here. And George told them about the ruins that everybody knew was here, but we thought, or they thought, they were belonged to the indigenous peoples because why would somebody in northern Newfoundland suspect that the Vikings had been here a thousand years ago? But the Norse were not the only people to occupy this land. For thousands of years, indigenous peoples had called this place home. We are thankful for our indigenous peoples who have looked after this land for generations. Newfoundland and Labrador is part of the traditional territories of the Mi'kmaq, the Beothic, the Inuit, and the Innu. It is also the ancestral land of many early indigenous peoples, such as the Maritime Archaic, the Dorset, the Grosswater, and the Thule peoples. All of our protected areas as our national parks and historic sites are on indigenous lands and we value the relationship we have with indigenous peoples. They are our partners and the 
true stewards of our land and waters. In 1978, Lanza Meadows was the first cultural heritage site in the world to be recognized by UNESCO, which is the United Nations Educational Scientific Cultural Organization. The site is internationally significant for what it tells of the worldwide movement of people around the globe. Just remember when the Norse or the Vikings made contact with indigenous peoples here in this region, the earth had then been completely encircled by humanity. So that connection represents the movement of people around the globe. All right, now I would like to introduce you to, well, maybe I'll let them introduce themselves. Here we have a couple of our Norsemen from back in the day. Hello, hello, Jesse and all, all the places. I am Tora Ulfstadter but I'm also known as the Battle Axe. I'm the weaver, spinner, knitter, cook, clean, and make the beer here on site and keep all the men under control. And fed. And fed, oh, fed indeed. Like I'm doing a little bit of carding here. With that, you pull on it. You pull a little bit of it off. One of the main things that they found here on site to let you know that there were women here was the spindle world and it's just a little small stone at the end of my stick right here and this is how that they would have made yarn back then they would have combed it with the with your carding combs put it on your drop spindle like this and use the weight and start spinning and making yarn Woo! he wants to fall off what that's trials of it you would learn how to do this when you were a little girl. So you start all over again. You put it on there and you spin it again. You're good at that, Thor. Oh, yes, I am. And, and do you want to tell them who you are? Well, I can. Hi, everyone. My name is Ragnar Rudskager. Rudskager is an old uh, Norse for Redbeard. Now, I am the brother of Tora, so my last name is Ulf's son. So our dad's name was Ulf. Now, I'm the blacksmith, but right now I'm keeping my axe sharp because when we get back to, to uh, Vinland, we're going to start chopping more trees. I'll probably repair the axes too as well. So axes, of course, is important. As a blacksmith, pots are important. Tripod for when we hang our stuff on. Also, cooking utensils. There you see these. Like Thor, I got some bread going here. This looks, this looks yummy. Like really good. And when we're thirsty, we drink out of horns. Did you hear that? <laughs> oh, good stuff. You make good stuff. Yes. I now do. you might say that. Vikings, as you hear a lot of us saying, Vikings has horn helmets. But hey, do you see a horn on this helmet? No. Of course, this one here is what we use our own for, is to drink out of. And if you're thirsty, I recommend you to go get a horn. Now, just to show you, fill out the, the pot too as well. Now, I can't, okay, kids, I, I, I know you like looking at weapons. I guarantee that when I was your age, I loved weapons. So one of the weapons I'll show you is a sword. Right well, Give me a knife, I cut up the bread. Sisters, always in line, always wants their brother stuff, they do. Well, this is a sword the Norse had. Now, not everybody wants a sword. Everybody has an axe. Well, the people who owns the sword actually is her husband. Her husband is the chief, and he owns the sword. So this is their bed when they when we sleep and go on uh, voyages on sailboat. When we go ashore, we pitch the tent. Yeah. Of course, in the tent, we have the bed. We have the bedding. 
uh, all the pillows. Of course, you've just seen Tora how she spun it. Now this, of course, is how uh, then she weaves it into there. And in the back there, there's weaving. I don't know if you can see it, but it's dark in there. That's because they want to go to sleep. And of course, we have a spare. Really good for spares. You know what spares are really good for? Stabbing fish out of the brook, hunting with it too as well to get uh, food to put in that pot. Right? Yeah, yes. Yeah. As you can tell, we have some uh, stuff left over. We had some rabbit earlier. We had some rabbit. We're after finding some seals around here. I'm sitting on a nice caribou skin. You use everything that you hunt. You use everything, right from the bones for making carvings or the antlers for making a needle case holder for putting my needles in. I knew I was going to drop that here. Look. And some bread. And now the bread that he's eating is made with wheat, mm -hmm. rye, oat, barley, spelt, a little bit of dried berries, and some water. She got to cut that big. I, yes, I, I'm big, but I'm not uh, that big. I'll cut a little bit smaller. Mm. Good stuff. Oh, it's good bread. Mm. Uh, why don't we tell them what we're wearing? Mm. I'm wearing a nice uh, long red dress with a wool over apron, and it's called a tube apron. I have a belt on, and on my belt, I have the keys to our house. I have a whistle. I have the shears for shearing the sheep, because it's very important to bring the sheep along, because our sails are made out of wool. And if you don't have sheep along and you break your sail, how are you going to get back home? You won't be able to. And I've got some more little fangle things dangling here. I have an ear spoon, a toothpick, a thing for cleaning my fingernails. What, what, what's the ear spoon? For cleaning your ears. Clean. Just on the outside. How come father never give me one of those? Oh, your wife should have it. And I've got a nice pair of scissors too. And I've got a comb. It's a woman's job to make a man look good. Sometimes she's got a lot to work with, and some more times she's got a lot of work. Now, what are you wearing? All right. Oh, and I've got some lovely socks on, and I got a nice pair of leather shoes. All right, kids. I got leather boots. I don't know if you can see my leather boots. I'll put my foot up here, so then I got leggings that wrap around, keep my pants. You know how many pairs of pants I own? Yes, two. So I put this around my pants to keep my pants from being tore up when I work around the ground. It keeps my legs warm, and you know what? It keeps the bugs from biting me. Now I got a pair of linen pants, and I have a nice over to uh, under tunic linen, and I have a Nice wool over to, you know, it's getting cold now, right? Very cold out. Now they get to sleep in there, but I usually sleep on my sheepskin sleeping bag on the ground. So my tunic and my cloak. So my cloak keeps me warm. Now, I'm going to show you something that most of you always probably see looking at us Norsemen or Vikings. You probably see somebody with a helmet. Somebody with a sword. You want this one? No. You want the blue one? I'll get this one. And somebody with a shield. This is the image you usually see. But, hey, this is only... Rich people have it, and when we say rich, we say kings and chiefs. Yes, and not all Norsemen are Vikings, but all Vikings are Norsemen. It is actually to go a raiding, to go pillaging. So the ones that were coming to Lance and Meadows were actually explorers. So they're Norsemen coming to harvest things from here to take back home to Greenland to make Greenland a nicer place to live. I think the last voyage we had, we took them back a little bit. We, we took about 20 to 30 tons of cargo back I mean, with us. I remember that your, your 
her husband, Finn, he went down around uh, the southern parts of Vinland and he got some uh, butternuts too. We butternuts. Did. We found some butternuts. Oh, and, and he brought back the grapes. And he brought back the grapes. That's right. That's yeah. Right. So we had some. That was a good, that was a good fall. That, that was, was a good, good harvest. harvest. That was a really good harvest. When we got back to Greenland, it was all, oh, you should have seen the people when they greeted us back in Greenland. They welcomed us with open arms. We had so much wood. It was it was good. Well, we had the grapes and the grape vines, and I made myself a new basket. Yeah. To put my knitting in that in. Yeah. My right. wooden needle and my wool and my spinning and my spindle world. So hopefully now we'll uh, we'll get a good harvest again now when we get back to Greenland to bring back some more wood to, uh, yes. to Greenland and help Greenland grow. Yes. So there's a lot of wood we got to go harvesting. Yes. Yeah. So. So you want to uh, cut up some more of that bread for me? Sure. Do you want to show them some of that cooking utensils? There? Oh, I certainly can. Mm. I'll hand you a little bit. This is my spiral iron. It is cool. uh, used for cooking greasy meats, putting it on the fire and letting the, the, the spiral iron do the work for you. Cook the big pieces of meat. And of course, I've got my pot. Here that makes stews. Most of the food that we eat is stews. Stews or beans or soups. So we've got a pot and we've got a ladle here. And then we've got the flat iron like I use for cooking the flat on the, the flatbread. Cooking it right over the open fire. Or the frying pan. So when you go on Viking uh, or Norse expeditions, make sure you got your bowl for stew and your spoon for eating your stew and your horn for drinking the water or milk. All right, this is your three things that you need. Now, in saying that, I'll get back to just a little bit, touch on my blacksmithing. Now, there's a hammer, right? That's for uh, hammering the metal. There's my anvil back here. I have a set of tongs too, as well. Tongs are used for pinching stuff, and of course, nails. We make nails, so and I repair tools and all that stuff too as well. So, hammer, tongs, and an anvil, and I can make anything. All the stuff you see in front of you, I can make with this, this, and that. Fantastic. Thora Ragnar, I'm so curious. You've mentioned Vinland a few times. What does Vinland mean? Why is it called that? Is there any specific reason or anything that we can translate for our kids? It means land of wine. And wine comes from grapes. And grapes, where well, we got grapes here in Vinland, is what me and Thora was just saying last, is Finn was traveling further south and found grapes around where he found butternut trees. So Vinland is land of wine. Ooh. I'm so curious too. So since it was so fruitful, you're going back to Greenland, you're bringing back all the stuff, you're bringing lumber, you're bringing baskets, you're bringing all these great materials. Why leave? Dale mentioned at the beginning that it was only a fairly short time that the Norse were here. Um, what drove you away? Or was it just that you took everything you needed and wanted to go? Well, your families and everything is back home in Greenland. You're only coming over here to harvest things to take things back to Greenland to make Greenland a nicer place to live. That's why we go back to Greenland. Yeah, there's only a small crew of us, maybe two or three ships that come, because Greenland is only uh, very small. Greenland is about 500 people. And when we came down, it was about 60 when we came. So you're right. taking a, a people away from Greenland. Greenland is, it has to establish its uh, colony. And if we're going away from the colony that's not established, it's, it's a hard time. So. And we got farmland back home in Greenland, too. We don't want to come and stay. We just want to see what the land has to offer so we can help Greenland grow. And when we came over here, it's not necessarily families coming over here. It's a ship's crew of 25, 30 men and only two to five women. We're coming over here to work and get back home. Interesting. Thank yeah. you very much for the clarification there. Um, and by the way, uh, if you're good with it, I'll do a, a toast with my own Viking drinking horn that I've got here. Uh, and I'll encourage our classes. If you guys have any questions, I know our YouTube classes, we got classes in St. Anthony right down the road from you guys. Uh, we've got Mr. Fleezy's class in Palmerston. We've got a whole bunch of live classes with us. If you're good with it, I can start taking questions from all our classes. Does that sound good? Sure. 
Sure. Well, Dale, did you, want to, did you want to share anything else? If there's anything else you want to share, please do take us away. <laughs> uh, okay, I'll just have a couple of words and then we can go back to Thora and uh, Ragnar and uh, they'll take any more questions that the kids have for them. Amazing. Uh, I just wanted to uh, end off by saying thank you, everybody, for joining us. This has been amazing. It's been so good having you. Wish I could see you all, obviously, but I know you're there. Um, I just want to make a quick comment. You know, the Norse came, they settled, they spent some time here, and then they went home. But they did leave their mark on the landscape. And there's no record that they ever returned. And I should have mentioned a moment ago, why did they leave? We don't know for sure, but we know that this was never an attempt at a permanent settlement. It was a base camp where they came and stayed for a season or two, explored the region and exploited the resources. And when I say exploited the resources, they gathered anything that they found here that they could use back home in Greenland and took it with them. And then they returned to their families. There were at least three voyages that occurred over a period of about 30 years. And evidence from the archeological work that was done here, they found evidence that the houses burnt. And we suspect that when they left here for the final time, they probably knew they would never be coming back. And they built their houses and sailed away back home to Greenland. So thank you. And I'm going to put it back to Ragnar and Thora, and they can answer any questions you have about the Vikings or the oh. Norse. Well, thank you so much, Dale. And Thor and Ragnar, we're going to have a whole bunch of questions for you. We've got a ton of time for Q&A with our classes. Um, and I want to note one thing really worth noting, because this was something that I missed when I was a kid and I find really fascinating. So the Norse come over and again, 10 years over a 30 year period was about 400 plus years before European colonists came back over. So it's this huge gap of time, which is just a, an incredible thing to realize in terms of world history. I just encourage our classes to look into that. We've got some history loving kids on our YouTube chat as well. Uh, just a, a really neat piece to, to go home with today. Thora Ragnar, we got a great question from our class, Miss Reardon's class in St. Anthony. They want to know, Thora, where do you get your wool? Where are these sheep? What's going on? <laughs> I, brought, I brought four or five sheep along with me on the ship. Amazing. So there is there a bit large group of sheep in neat and greenland then or like oh, well, we've got the ones when we moved from iceland to greenland we took animals with us animals of all sorts sheep goats cows chickens pigs we moved everything from iceland to greenland but when i came over here there's only so much space on the ship so i decided to take three little uh, female sheep and one male sheep with me she she never told you when we had to go run around to catch the ram when he ran away. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> They're around. The sheep are around. around. They're in, in the land. Yeah, they're behind the tent. We'll, we'll find them if we can. Oh, um, they're, yes, they're, they're somewhere. They got up on the hills. <laughs> they are <laughs> on the hills down here in Lens Meadows. Uh, Mr. Dunn's class, grade fours, we're going to head to you guys first for a question. Uh, live, you want to come on in? You're good to go. Hey. Oh, Mr. Dunn, your audio is off for some reason. I don't know why. Play with it and see. And even if you have to sign in and sign in again, that's really weird because it was working earlier. We're going to get Mr. Dunn's class in. He's an old pro. Miss Comar's class, grade sevens, we're going to head to you guys. If you have a question for us, we'll wait for Mr. Dunn coming in in a sec. Uh, Mr. Santoro, Miss Comar, welcome in. Hello. Hello. <laughs> Any questions for Ragnar and Thora today? <laughs> Why didn't they sail more south? <laughs> Why didn't you go further south? Mm, good question. Good question. Well, when you look at, we're going back here to the houses that they've been built, but we uh, go further south. We go down uh, to the southern parts of inland. Now, do they go further, further south down where I think they call uh, Boston or Maine? We don't know, but they may have, but the further we go away, 
from our houses that we built here in Vinland, the northern parts of Vinland, the, the longer it takes to get back. And uh, where we live, winter is coming and you further go away, it's going to get a hard time to come back. So, so you only go so far south to explore. You only go so far as you know that you can get back to your houses for the winter in time. Yeah. And this is really important. This speaks to that point that we talked about earlier, that this is a work site. This is not we're going to settle and be here permanently. If you do that, maybe you do look for more temperate climates. But if you're just going for resources to get back and bring that back to your community, again, as close as possible. So great question, Ms. Comar's class. Mr. Dunn, with feeling, fingers crossed for good audio, check. No, try again, talk to you for one quick sec. No, it doesn't like you. Share a question in the chat. I'm so sorry, that's so weird. Um, that's okay, we'll figure it out. We'll take one from our White Hills Academy crew. So again, this is like the most uh, Newfoundlanders we've ever had in a broadcast, this is amazing. So when, uh, Riley wants to know, when did the Norsemen first come to Lonsa Meadows and when did they leave for the last time? Is there like a certain AD uh, time frame that we can share with our kids? <laughs> Well, we know around the year 1000, but when they were doing, when our archaeologist was here a couple of years ago, they did a dig and they did find some wood that actually dates to 1021. So we don't know if that's the first trip, the last trip or the two. We know there was three, four voyages over here, but we don't know exactly which voyage that was. So we know for sure that they were here 1021. So we could say 1000 AD to 1030, like yeah. you mentioned at the beginning, Jess, about yep. the, the life of the site. Yeah. So, so say we, we come at 1000, we leave at 1030. Let's we'll play it safe and do that. Cool. The fact that we know that, that we can find that out through science and, and sort of archaeology is incredible. So very, very cool. Thank you so much for that question, guys. We're going to go to Brampton. The best food in Canada is in Brampton. Every time I get the chance to go there, I love it. Aloma Crescent, if you guys want to come on in, unmute your mic and uh, share a question with us. Hey, guys. Hi. 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 Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. Hi. Hello. We're just in there first. Okay, ask your question. Who are your enemies? Ooh, who are your enemies? Great question. Mm. I'll take that one. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Well... I don't know. Uh, some people said our enemies were uh, the Anglo-Saxons, which uh, we call English today. And some uh, considered it to be the, the Franks, which are people from France. Uh, also, uh, maybe people from Scotland uh, and Ireland. And sometimes our enemies may be ourselves too as well, because we know that sometimes you get into an argument with somebody you know and you get into a fight or, or a, um, a little di a, the disagreement. And so sometimes your enemies could be anybody. Yep. Great question, guys. All right, Mr. Dunn's class, I'm going to bring them back in on the off chance the tech wants to work. And if it doesn't, I have the question in the chat. But Nevin's question, and great question, by the way, did the Vikings have any interactions with the First Nations people? Dale talked at the beginning about this long tradition of indigenous ancestry in Newfoundland, in Vinland. Uh, did you guys interact with them at all? Do we know? Yeah, well, we know that they had, out of the four voyages, we know that they had uh, they had uh, encounters with, uh, two, uh, two encounters with the indigenous people. The first one was Thorvald Eriksson, which was Lake's brother, who was the second voyage here, according to the sagas. And he uh, had an encounter, and it wasn't very uh, a pleasant encounter. They end up fighting against uh, each other. But then also there's a third voyage here by Thorfinn, Carl Sefni, and Gudrid, and they actually start trading cloth, like red cloth you see it on this bed for furs. And eventually they started trading because the furs uh, uh, stayed the same and the cloth got less because you got to have sheep producing wool, like you've seen Thor spinning it and all that stuff too as well. But... Uh, then the clock got very uh, small, so they start trading uh, milk for first, huh. and uh, then they—that's uh, the second encounter with the with the indigenous people here. Yep, fantastic, great question, Nevin. And and by the way, I, again, worth noting that there's a diversity of interactions, just like a lot of uh, sort of the history of European meeting indigenous cultures in North America. Sometimes it goes really well, sometimes very much not. So I'm glad we got a little bit of nuance there in some of the different encounters. Thanks, guys. Uh, Miss Reardon's class is a great question. How long does it take to travel from Greenland to Vinland or Newfoundland? What's that journey look like? 
Well, if you do it as the crow flies, it <laughs> takes you 600 nautical miles. But for the Norsemen, which they're not birds, they actually sailed it. They sailed from Greenland to Baffin Island, the coast of, down to the coast of Labrador, and then straight across to here. So it took roughly about 1,200 nautical miles. Wow. So they tell us seven days. Yeah. But that's, uh, they call it dogger. Okay, everyone, dogger is a day. It's a word that we uh, uh, use to uh, represent a day in, in Norse time, okay? Huh. Now, a dogger is uh, a daylight day of a, of a 24 hour clock. So, with seven doggers to get here, that's the sailing time. That's not the time you spend a week on shore because the water wouldn't be good for you to be sailing in. So, we don't know how long it takes to get here, but the sailing time takes seven days. So worth noting, with that distance, for our students that might have had the opportunity to be on a plane in their lives, that's about a one-hour flight, or seven days on a ship, which is a <laughs> testament to modern travel ability. Uh, great question, guys. All right, YouTubers, please feel free to share more questions. Jack Hudson, if you guys have any, we'd love to hear from history-loving students. But we are going to do a second round with our live classes. So, Ms. Komar, Mr. Uh, Barbados class, if you guys have another one, Mr. Santoro, come on in. <laughs> Do you have do you have any do you know how to fight diseases? Ooh. Can you repeat that? I never heard of. Yeah, do you have any do you know how to fight diseases? If there were any epidemics or pandemics to sweep through your community, is there anything that you can do to fight back or not? There's some plants around that you can harvest. Like there's golden rod that'll help you with the flu. There's some yarrow that'll help too with different diseases. You the women were the ones that were doing most of the medicine. So they're the ladies that you would talk to. You would go to the ladies, the wise ladies, and they would find the medicines that they need. Well, if you're going to cut yourself, though, I'm going to put some bandages on it, and I'm going to wrap it really tight. And if it do turn dark, maybe we might chop it off <laughs> and burn it and fix it. But some of the plants outside, when somebody gets a cold, uh, there's lots of berries. There is lots and lots of berries. So this sickness that they call scurvy, we wouldn't have to worry about it because we have the vegetation around here to be able to, to fight off lots of diseases. So kids, remember when you go out playing around on your bike or out in the playground and when you fall down and scratch your knee or scratch your fingers and all that, we got band-aids and medicine for that. And our times is either plants and if the plants don't work, it may not be a good, your finger might get infected. Yeah. So always keep it clean, always keep it you know, uh, clean and covered. Good yeah. advice for any century, I find. Although I, I must say it's vaguely alarming that chopping and burning is part of the solution. I'm glad that we've <laughs> better in 2023. You, you are uh, talking to Norseman. <laughs> we're going to head to our White Hills Academy crew. Kaylin wants to know how the sod huts were made. How do you make your homes out there? Well, we harvest the, the wood right off the site to make the, the wooden structure. Our exterior walls is actually six feet thick. We've got two feet of peat, two feet of gravel, and then two feet of peat again. And you put your wooden structure inside and your main beams go right on down and touch the gravel. And then we put a layer of sticks across them again. And then we add a layer of peat overlapping layer of birch bark, another layer of peat, then live sod right on top. So when you look at our houses and you see the lovely green roofs, that's how they're built. Uh, we leave the grass on the outside so it's a bit of camouflage, cool. but it helps with the moisture too. Because if anything hits the, the grass or the first layer of peat, it runs down the birch bark and filters throughout the walls of our side building. So it is a wonderful construction. And if you ever do get a chance to come to visit us in, in uh, Midland, we greatly appreciate seeing you. Uh, you know what, we're gonna bring them on, all of them, I think. I'm gonna come up next summer, I'm very excited, and I think our kids will be <laughs> this broadcast. Um, we're gonna add to Mr. Dunn, who promises me that he has used his cutting and burning wizarding powers to get the audio working on his broadcast. We're gonna check in and find out. Yes. Yay! Hey! Yay. Too many cords plugged in. Uh, Lucas has a, has a question here. How 
how big were the Viking ships? How big were the Viking ships? Great that's question. a good question, Lucas, right? Lucas, that's a good question. Well, how can I say that? We can say that they're 50 feet long. So I don't know how you, you look. You count with your feet, count your feet twice. So it's 100 your feet that you put together. That's how long uh, a Viking ship is. And it's 20 feet wide. Yeah. Okay. So I'm six feet span. So do that three times, stick me three times across. And I'm and the boat is eight feet high from the bottom to the top, and I'm five ten. So the boat would be way up there from the bottom to the top. So fifty feet long, twenty feet wide, and eight foot high, from the keel to the to the guns. Very very cool. I and, it, and it takes twenty uh, tons, and there's two thousand pounds in a ton in a ton. I will note for our students, we've actually done a program live from a re recreation of a Viking ship in one of our past broadcasts. If you want to look up the Draken, we've actually had that on several times on our broadcast that our students can check out what one of those ships looks like on YouTube, which is very cool. Um, thanks, Lucas. Um, we're going to do one online question with our White Hills and Miss Reardon's class, and then we're going to wrap up with Miss Miller in a minute. There's sort of a joint question from two of our classes. So our, our Newfoundland crew wants to know about your tools. Where do you get them? Do you have to repair them? What's the deal with all these axes and spears and shields and all this other stuff that you have on the go? Well, uh, where we get uh, the metal is actually one of the things about Vinland is this is where iron was done for the first time. So axes, of course, some axes are used to cut different parts of wood, of course. You need axes to chop trees, but you need to find the metal, right? So the metal, actually, see this? This is what we call a bog ore. And bog ore, where you find it, is, you know, where Tor was talking about the, uh, digging out the peat to build the houses? Well, underneath the peat, close to the brook, so the rivers, is this, okay? So now you need to take this, and you need to heat it up to... Some people says 1200 degrees Celsius and all that, but whatever that is, I just say you needed to heat it to yellow. Red and orange is colors, but you needed to heat it to yellow, okay? And it gets hot enough whoa, oh, <laughs> that you make it into a big clump of iron. Now, this big clump of iron needs to be worked down because it still has a lot of junk in it. And when I say junk, it has glass. Because Bagor has sand and iron. So the sand at color yellow turns to glass. So then oh, you hammer down to this. And this, of course, then gets hammered to an axe, to a spear, to a sword, to a pot, to a cooking utensil, to a knife, to nails. So anything that you see of iron starts from this. Goes to this, goes to this, and eventually, there you are. Goes to nails or tools. Ragnar, our kids today just have to go to Canadian Tire and pick up all these things. You had to do a lot of work. That's why you got such strong arms, I think, from all this hammering. I think some people now call me Canadian Tire. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we're going to take one more final question this has been so much fun so many great classes our Miller crew uh, if you guys want to come on in unmute your mic you are good to go to wrap us up hey. why is Lost All Metals a fence name ooh great question <laughs> oh what is it a French name yeah well, the reason why Lance of Metals is a French name is actually nothing to do with the Norse. It's actually, this was the, the coast of Newfoundland was the French fishing uh, shore until 1904. So all the names you see around uh, Newfoundland is a lot of French names. So Lance is named after uh, people who came here. So Lance means bay or cove uh, of, uh, uh, well, they say it metals, but it's not metals. It's a... There's a figurine that's on a, most of the French uh, gallons that came here fishing, and it protects the coves and inlets and the boats. Very 
very cool. I want to blow some kids' minds right now for a minute. So again, uh, you speak to this sort of changing history, changing sort of colonization of the island over many, many centuries that led to this name. Uh, for our students that might not know, there are two islands that are still a bit of France right off the coast of Newfoundland. So you can take a ferry from Newfoundland, which is not too far to St. Pierre and Miquelon, which is actual French territory, French license plates. You have to have a passport to go there. Uh, many of our students didn't know that. I didn't know that until I was like 25. So uh, a bit of that history uh, writ large and still today, which is a very cool supplement to today's broadcast. Ragnar, Thora, Dale, Bonnie Lou in the background. This has been such a fun time. I want to encourage all our classes, parks.canada.ca for the entire parks crew. Uh, lots of meadows specifically. I'm going to make sure all our classes have this link and can keep the learning going when they're done. The UNESCO World Heritage Site is, a website is right here. And again, it's one of the most special places on earth are UNESCO World Heritage Sites. Lots of meadows is right down the street from me, metaphorically speaking, uh, right in your country for a lot of our Canadian friends today. So I really encourage you to take the time to learn more. This has been an absolute hoot. Thank you all so much for this uh, deep dive into the history and what we do to wrap up every broadcast. I'm going to bring in Ms. Comar's class, Ms. Miller's group, Mr. Dunn's class, White Hills back at home, and our other YouTube classes. You can join me in saying a big thank you and farewell as well. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining, and bye for now.